you can't think about yourself because it's stress. Uh, and stress is not healthy. It's it's really bad. It kills people. And and you, you're not allowed. To, it, it, it prevents you from thinking from the mind and doing creative solutions and finding solutions. And, and it takes away enjoyment of life. Hello, everyone. I am actually like really excited today because we have like a medical icon on the show, Dr. Gary Epler. I'm just going to have you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to medicine. Yeah, sure, sure. I almost hesitate to tell you how it started because it's pretty rough. Uh, but, uh, but hey, I got to tell you, uh, I was basically a B student. And at MCAT, uh, hey, I didn't do well. And as a result, I kind of was rejected from 5, 10, 20, so on, medical schools. And then I, um, I but I didn't want to give up uh, because the theme of today's session is really going to be be your true authentic self. That's, that's really what, what life is about. Be your true, authentic self. And I realized I became obsessed with becoming a doctor. It sounds silly, but I saw someone in a wheelchair and I says, I want to learn how to help that person. Uh, it kind of went in my mind. It was kind of a silly thing, but it stuck. And, and I really wanted to improve lives. That was what I wanted to do. And then I became obsessed with that and getting into medical school. And, and I was walking down First Avenue in New York City, just been rejected from NYU. And I w w was not depressed, but I was, I was beaten. <laughs> I was, uh, I mean, enough's enough. I, I just can't do this. And someone called me out. They said, hey, the last time I looked that bad, my head was down, I was shuffling along. The last time I looked that bad, I was at a funeral. Oh, it, it, it just woke me up for some reason. I got in my car, went down to New Orleans and knocked on the door at, at, uh, at the Dean of Admissions at Tulane. And it was the first day of medical school, September opened up the door, and he says, you're in. I was full of I mean, I was speechless. It was the best thing that had ever happened in my life. And, and so that was the story. And it got me started. And I enjoyed every minute, every minute of it. And then uh, I, I met my wife along the way. I, I was training for the New York Marathon here in Boston along with Charles River. And it was 5.30 in the morning, and she was coming the other direction. I made the U-turn, and she had her mace. So I'll put it off for a while. And, and, and so we had our first date at, at Cheers, uh, the bar here, uh, at, at the movie, uh, the uh, TV series. And then we went on, and our first anniversary, we ran the Greek Marathon together, which was just phenomenal. And, and since then, it's just been a magical life, and, and it, it's been fantastic. Uh, so, so there you go. Be your true self, and, and this is really what it, what it's going to come down to. Uh, and and as far as being a doctor, uh, you really should go into this with the right right reason. And I guess it was like me that said uh, wheelchair. I wanted to improve people's lives. That's what I wanted to do. It had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with me. He, that's this thing about being yourself is stop thinking about yourself. The more you are, the less you stop thinking, the more you stop thinking about yourself, the more you are your true self. And, and, it, and it really, really pays off. I, and because I, I love what I was doing and I just love to see patients because I got to improve their lives. And you don't want to go into medical school because, well, it's a job. <laughs> Uh, you can make money. It's a, it's a stable job. Or your parents want you to do that. It, 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 that's not why you want to go. Because uh, medical school is really easy uh, if you want to do it. It, it, it really is. It's, it's very enjoyable if, if you want to, to be a doctor for the right reason. And to further show the difference, 
again, that this concept of being yourself of a, of a doctor who's really there because you know, their parents want them to be there or, or they just, you know, they didn't have anything else they wanted to do. Uh, they, 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 there's a patient there in front of them with a belly of cancer, opened up belly of cancer. Well, if you're thinking about, oh, geez, I don't want to be here. You're thinking about the, complaining about the insurance companies or complaining about this. Or, that's not why you're why you're there. <laughs> and, and you look at that belly and, and well, let's see the, the teachers and all and everything tells me, yeah, close it up and tell the family we can't do anything. That that's, would be what most doctors would do and appropriate. But if you're yourself and you're there only to improve people's lives, you're going to use your mind. You're not going to use your head. You're not going to be thinking about yourself. And the mind is, is unlimited. There's unlimited knowledge, information, past, present, future. It's all there. And you're looking at that belly, cancer everywhere. You're not thinking about yourself and you're using the mind. Oh, why don't I do this? You know, a little of that. Do a little of that. And, and then the nurse says, oh, you, you can't do that because doctors don't do that. Mm -hmm. What difference does it make? It makes no difference at all. This is not a gallbladder in room 304. This is this person right here, right this moment, family. <laughs> and, 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 and this is what I think might solve the situation because I'm using the mind. And you do it. And that patient's alive 30 years later. That's the difference between uh, uh, somebody sort of being a doctor because they either because it's a job or because they uh, their parents want them to be uh, versus someone that really wants to improve people's lives and are not thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about, oh, if I see 20 patients, then I'll get a promotion. Or if I do something uh, to, uh, I'll make more money or something. It's not about that. Nothing about it. It's not about you at all. And, and, and it, it's fantastic. Uh, and, and so as someone asked me, how do you be your true self? I had to give a seminar about health and so forth. That well, I found out that it was my third discovery. And Rakita, we talked about making discoveries, and uh, in a medical school, I, I was so excited about being in medical school. I, I, I was nuts. I was so excited about it. I, I, I remember my second year. I was, you know, we do histology and we're doing textbook work and. I said, I gotta see patients. I gotta see. I, I gotta see patients. I can't stand this. You know? So I started a little clinic down in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. And every Tuesday night, I would go down. I talked to a pediatric professor and doing it with me, and a couple of my buddies. And we would uh, go into the little clinic. It's, it was just a house with a door on it, but and we'd take blood pressures and whatever we could do. And it was free and free clinic, but I, I, I just I had to see patients. And so part of that was I wanted to uh, get involved in international health. And I, uh, I talked to the parasitology professor and he uh, let me uh, go to South America to work on discovering a parasite. And it was, it was a lung fluke is a common name for it. And they, they knew the cercaria and they knew the adult, but they didn't know one of the little little cycles, cercaria, it's called. And they'd sent someone down here before, a medical student, in three months and didn't get up the answer. The answer had to, it had to do with snails, you know, parasite and snails and, and the lions and so forth, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the chucha, the, uh, the Spanish, <laughs> what is the word for that? Possums, possums. Possums would eat the snails and then lions would eat the possums and then that would keep it going. So I was supposed to find this little snail and, and a student had looked at, oh, thousands of these snails. And, uh, and so 
I went down there and, well, I'm supposed to do the same thing. And I did for about a week or two, three. This, this, this isn't the answer. Ron, he, this, he's done this for this long. And I've been doing that and finding the same thing. This is a waste of time. And, and I got an old textbook, Russian textbook, 1920s or 30s, <laughs> looking at the pictures. And there's a tiny little snail there, real, real tiny. You can already even see. And we've been looking at big ones. And, and so off I went to the jungle uh, and, and got a bunch of these snails and about 100, I think the 150th snail, there it was. And, and it was exciting. It was like the old Eureka, this term Eureka. Is, uh, it was exciting to call the professor and, and say that I found it. And, and it, it was a real discovery and completed that and it was published. And, and that, that was really exciting. And then, uh, then in Boston, uh, my training pulmonary, critical care training, I, uh, my friends were going off to cell biology, which is popular, uh, and that was very good. They were doing cell biology. I said, no, no, no I, I have to see people. I can't do cell biology. I got to see people. And a professor was, had... Uh, saw people, and he had a computer with 5,000 lung disease patients in there. And they said, oh, don't, don't go. He, he's, he's nuts. He, he's a horrible person. He, he's a slave driver. He'll yell at you. And so I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. It's people. <laughs> and so I, I went there, and, I, I, and, I, and when I was in medical school that second year, I remember a term, bronchiolitis obliterans. And for some reason, I get like, bronchiolitis obliterans. It just becomes musical. And I said, what is that? <laughs> it's a mystery. That's the professor said, it's a mystery. Oh, okay. And it went on. But hey, here it was. 5,000, 5,000 lung diseases. And I pushed in. It was an old computer. I mean, they had a general computers or something. You would flip a bunch of levers and things. And I put 89 in. That was the code. And 100 cases came out. 100 bronchiolitis obliterans. I said, oh, well, let's see if we can solve this mystery. So I dug into every single one of them, the x-rays, lab, everything. And 50 of them were different from anything that's ever been described. 50. The other 50 were the typical bronchiolitis obliterans, the airway problem uh, from a fume, a toxic fume, sulfuric acid or something. But these were different. They had abnormalities in their chest X or patchy infiltration. Bronchiolitis obliterans is the airway thing. There's no X ray abnormalities, but not this group. They had the patchy infiltration. And they had a low diffusing capacity. Well, that's the opposite of, of this other bronchiolitis. And they, they had no airway obstruction. The whole point of bronchiolitis obliterans, you know, obliterate the airways and you have severe obstruction. They didn't, didn't have that. And the good thing was, it was cured with prednisone therapy. So I said, oh, gee, this is phenomenal. So I went to the professor. <laughs> Showed him a case. He growled. And yeah, just uh, go do my work. Because as, as a fellow, you're supposed to do what the professor tells you to do. All right. And so uh, a couple of months went by, I went back again. This is just too exciting. <laughs> Showed him another case. <laughs> He threw me out this time. Quit showing me these cases. Oh, go out, out, out. You know, like, okay, okay. But three more months went by, and I, I mean, I just kept. I mean, a friend of mine says, "What's that? What's that light on in that blue building? Well, well you're, what are you doing there? 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. You're supposed to sleep. You're, you know, fellowship. You're not supposed to be up all night. So it's too exciting. Too exciting. So I went back third time. I showed him this case. And he started in. <laughs> I said, hold it. Just hold it. I got 50 of these. 
He says, quit showing me this same case. And well, I got 50 of them. Oh, well, why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> and so we published that in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's boop. It's bronchiolitis, obliterans, organizing pneumonia. The OP, the organizing pneumonia, is what was different. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was boop. And it was fantastic. It was just fantastic. It's just crazy to hear all of the things for the students who are listening. I just want to point out a few things that highlights that you've said, like, number one, some students write in that they may not have gained acceptance the first or second time. Like, it's OK. Keep trying. If it's your calling, you figure out a way, like look at the application and, and kind of make yourself shine and be yourself and be in and just navigate that. Also staying true to what your why and your purpose is. Like, yes, people want to help people, but why? And then when you're in the trenches, when you do make it into school and residency and fellowship and beyond, always looking back to that why. Like, why are you there? Why are you helping people? And then why shouldn't we make people a number? So yes, one of my mentors once told me, you may have 20, 25 patients in a day, but most of the time, most of these patients only have that one visit. So make it special, make make it about them and not necessarily about their disease. And all of those things will come from that. And then you also mentioned about how you had fun in the journey and you were exploring, oh. you were inquisitive and you were curious and yeah. being quite the researcher, you discover profound things like the parasite. And then my personal favorite, the boop, because boop. In residency, we saw a lot of that. So my question for you, for the students who may be listening is like how, since times are changing in terms of, I'm sure we could help do a whole episode on like how the medical profession has evolved over time, but like how can students work to continue to discover and innovate in medicine? That's huge, huge. Uh, and actually uh, it, it leads to my third discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, I, I set out to make a third discovery. I discovered the cause of a disease. I, did, I characterized the disease, and I wanted to go on and, and, and find a cure, a treatment. But it was going to be on a commercial basis because academic basis, you can't scale. Number two, it was going to improve the lives, not of one, but of millions of people. Uh, those were the two criteria. It, it was basically going to be a public health type of discovery. It's like if you've taken epidemiology, uh, you learn about uh, Snow, Professor Snow in the 1800s, who took away the, the handle of the pump, uh, the, the water pump in Boston, in, in, in London, uh, and it prevented cholera. Uh, and it was a kind of a public health discovery. So that's what I set out to do. And actually, I set out to do that uh, after Boop. And, and it's taken me many, many, many iterations and many failures <laughs> and thousands of rejections, but whatever. I have arrived. I did find that and made that discovery, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. It reminds me of, of a change, a medical change. Oh, it, it's been very dramatic. Uh, the good parts has have been the the uh, the evolution of, of, of technology and med tech, mm -hmm. the AI, the the ability to, for, for example, DVT, uh, detect DVT uh, and prevent pulmonary embolism. Uh, nurses and doctors, we can do it, you know, with our eyes and numbers and things like that. Uh, and, and takes probably for 24 to 36 hours to do that. AI uh, through monitoring can do it within uh, one or two hours. And, and the same with, with, uh, with this uh, explosive diarrhea from Clostridia, uh, from antibiotics. People die from that. And by the time we as humans detect that, it's, it's too late. But AI can detect that uh, within uh, within a few hours, and, and you get uh, antibiotic uh, treatment started. And, and, and it's like in the OR, uh, we now can intubate. There's a robot that can now intubate patients. And yeah, I've done millions of intubations 
But it's difficult, especially when you've got bleeding, when you've got all kinds of demon problems. But this, this robot does it by sight, vision, but by vibration. And we don't have that capability. And then the ability of, of, of a black box in, in the OR of monitoring anesthesiology and EKG monitoring, it can detect uh, those abnormalities and fix them uh, in, in seconds. Uh, and, and, and that's fantastic. All of the, those are fantastic. And, and, and the cancer treatments and, and all of those, those are just fantastic. Uh, I, I, the change that, that people have trouble with is the the social change, I guess, social norms. And that's where the trouble is, uh, social norms. Uh, and, and social norms uh, change every 10 years, the new cycle. Uh, what's in is going to be out. And what's in is going to be out. What's in is going to be out every 10 years. And and that's, that's where the difficulty is because uh, insurance companies, uh, uh, management, uh, uh, big corporations, uh, all of these changes, uh, very, very dramatic. Uh, and, and, and how do you survive those? And not only survive, but how do you enjoy what you're doing? Because it's easy to complain. <laughs> it, it really is. Oh, they make me see 20 patients or they, I can only see patients in 15 minutes or something. Uh, and, and, and burned out. I mean, it's just happening really frequently uh, because they, because doctors are thinking about themselves. That's what it is. It's, you can't think about yourself. You just can't. And with, with social change like that, you, you can't think about yourself because it's stress. Uh, and stress is not healthy. It's it's really bad. It kills people. And and you, you're not allowed. To, it, it, it prevents you from thinking from the mind and doing creative solutions and finding solutions. And then it takes away enjoyment of life. So you, you can't think about yourself. That, that's really, really what it is when it comes to all these dramatic, and they're very dramatic. They really are, uh, changes in, in healthcare. You just be yourself and, and, and improve people's lives. And maybe if you get yourself in a situation of you're in a corporate hospital or, or whatever it is, and you gotta, you're just kind of a, uh, what you think of as oh, just part of a, of a company, you don't do that. <laughs> I mean, if it's, if it's get out of there and, and, and figure out a way you can improve people's lives. It's like, it's like, oh, it, it's like boop. I, uh, I I saw patients all over the world, and I, I got to teach doctors all over the world how to diagnose it and treat it. And they were sending me patients over to at the Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, and I loved that. I could bring in the whole family. And the thing I liked more than anything was they always left feeling better than when they came. That was just great. They could have end stage whatever, but they always feel a little better because of what we talked about. And, and it usually had nothing to do with medicines and pills and things like that. that that's sort of the, the given. But at any rate, I taught everybody so well they could stop sending me patients. So two years ago, I, had, I, I didn't see any patients, so I had to quit doing the clinical practice. But uh, I just, I mean, for me, and now I get to improve millions of people's lives. And, and, and so that's what it's about, this change, this social change. You, you, you just can't fight it. That's for sure, uh, because it's just a natural occurrence of, of life. And, and, but, but just be your true self. And, and uh, you want to improve patients, you figure out a way. Uh, so that's it. And so that leads me. To my third third discovery, and then we're all finished up. Uh, as I said, someone asked, "How do you how do you be your true self?" Mm -hmm. And I found out in December twenty nineteen from fMRI studies, functional MRI studies, that tells where we're thinking from. And we've never known that before. And if you see a picture of an angry person, 
when you're angry, what you're thinking from the amygdala. And I said, well, you know, that makes sense. And, and you can only think from one place at any time. So you can't think of two places. And so I said, well, be your true self moment by moment. You know, I added moment by moment. And that fixed the problem because it's, it's where you're thinking from. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking from the amygdala, the anger center, you're angry. <laughs> and unfortunately, that anger center would love to take you over your life. <laughs> and it loves junk food and no sleep. Because it's instinct. It goes in instinct. It's not for thinking. Don't think from there. And and then this the idea of stress, they said, okay, don't think about yourself in the MRI. If you do, the light will turn on, the red light will go on. You've got to learn to keep that red light off. Well, it took 21 days. But after 21 days, they kept that light off. Didn't think about themselves. You know, no complaints, no problems, this and that. And and three, six months later, they were healthier. Two times more productive, three times more creative and innovative. They were uh, better friends and better citizens with that one. Uh, and, and they enjoyed life more. Oh, because they didn't think about themselves. That's, that's better than any pill I know about. It's certainly better than any psychiatrist. And so that, that's really the idea. This is so who you want to know who you are? It's very simple. Stop thinking about yourself. Think from the heart. Think from the heart. There's 40 million neurons down there. They do, they do the job. Be kind to yourself first. You've got to be kind to yourself. You kind of have to love yourself. It really helps. <laughs> it really does. And then and, and be kind to everyone else. And, and giving, that's from the heart. Gratitude, appreciation, it's all from the heart. Just think from the heart not from the head. And the gut's good for risk management, nutrition. Ask. It'll help you with nutrition, that's for sure. And then the body, you can think from the body. But with uh, You've got to have a strong body. You've got to have this. And, and, and you think from the muscles and the joints. And certainly for, for athletes, for professional athletes. You don't want to think from the head. You've heard the expression a million times, I think in his head he can't play anything. And my favorite is the mind. And the mind is, is not the brain. Those things have been interchangeable for centuries. They are not, they're opposites. The brain is this physical limited thing, but the mind is unlimited. The, the brain is selfish. That's the best thing I can say. The brain is selfish. And selfish is not good. It's not good for you and not good for anyone else. And the mind is inspirational to improve the world. So that's it. That's my big discovery. Know who you are moment by moment. It's where you're thinking from. Think from the heart and think from the mind uh, with inspiration to improve the world and improve people's lives. I love that because it's, it's so important as people are starting their medical journey to just figure out like how to take things moment by moment and think from the mind. So I, I love that you have had yet another discovery. I, I want to, um, we're coming to the close. So I want to just give you an opportunity to let the listeners know how to reach out to you as well as give them opportunity to um, say goodbye. Oh, sure. Uh, I've got a website. It's, it's Epler Health. Uh, just like it sounds, E P L E R health, and it's got uh, all kinds of things on there. We've been doing a podcast for three years, all based on uh, this Eplerian life philosophy. That's the name of this uh, discovery, I guess. And uh, send me an email. It's uh, G what is it? Gary Epler at gmail dot com. Hey, I'll, I'll answer it. So send along. That's so awesome. For all of the students who are listening out there, please check that out. I think that it's a framework that can definitely help you as you navigate life and your journey, as well as trying to figure out like how to live and be your true self. Because as you guys have heard me on the podcast, like there's so much more to life than being a physician. That's a component of who you are, but not who you are as a person. So staying true to yourself is so important in this journey. 
And for all of the listeners out there who may have any recommendations of any topics that you want to talk about or any guests that you want to have, feel free to reach out to us on Med School Coach Instagram or my Instagram, Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter D Graham. And we'll get back to you. See you guys next week with another fantastic guest. Bye. Each episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access articles, videos, webinars, and free tools to help you succeed on your journey toward medical school and beyond, visit our website, perspectivedoctor.com. We hope you tune in again next time.